I'm going to start off with this slide. We're going to talk today about robotic telescopes. Um, I'm going to show you some of the things you can do. Uh, Naira is then going to take you later this morning into some of the more into some of the other things you can do with robotic telescopes and that will hopefully lead this afternoon into the work that Rosa does where she shows us about image processing so we can look at some of the images that get created and you can start to think about that if you have any questions um, I won't have the chat window open so um, Naira or Rosa or somebody else will maybe jump in and, and, and shout but um, if you do have any questions we'll We'll try and answer those as we go along. I'm going to do some slides. I appreciate it's quite a long session. So we'll we'll break it up about halfway through and we'll get you to do an activity and then we'll come back and finish the slides after that. So um, you don't have to sleep for the whole hour, hour and a quarter. So this is me. I'm based in the UK or in, in Wales. I, I work for the Open University, I work for the Fox Telescope Project and the National Schools Observatory. I'll explain a little bit about what each of them does. It gets a bit complicated and, and then Naira will probably make it slightly more complicated when she talks about Peter Project and the Spanish teachers uh, and, and the way that they can access that later. Um, the bottom line really is that you have our email addresses. If if there's something that we say that that makes sense or that you want to follow up, then then please contact us. So, if you see red on a slide, if you see a red title on a slide, that's my prompt to ask you a question. And I apologise. Some of you I know from the names um, may have seen this talk last year. Some of you maybe don't remember the exact questions and answers that we did a year ago, hopefully. I don't remember what I did yesterday, so that's probably okay. Um, again, somebody in the chat window, in fact, I can probably open it, um, may want to try and answer this as, as we go along. What is a robotic telescope? I appreciate you're here for me to tell you what a robotic telescope is, but does anybody have any ideas what a robotic telescope is, what we mean by robotic in this sense? So there is... Uh... Uh, Claudia says that it's a remote control telescope, accessible remotely, a telescope we can control uh, at distance. Yep. These are the three we have. One that it's operated remotely, a telescope that searches with, uh, with remote control. Okay. Yeah, I mean, re remote is part of it. It, it doesn't in, in some senses, it doesn't have to be remote. I, I could actually put a robotic telescope in my garden. Um, it wouldn't be a very good idea because it, we don't have the sky here, but um, I could put a robotic telescope in there. There's a degree of, I, I suppose, independence about the telescope that it doesn't necessarily need me to tell it what to do. The, the remote thing is, is certainly part of that for, for fairly obvious reasons. But yeah, good. That, that, that sounds about so, right. There is a fun one just uh, on. from Jacob that is uh, a telescope that lets me not stay up all night to, to stare at clouds. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think I've got a question that's, that, that, that's very similar to that coming up. So yeah, that, but that, that's a very valid point. Yeah. So it's something that doesn't have you know, has some degree of independence. It's not necessarily me pressing a button and the telescope responding immediately to that button press. So it has a degree of independence. Maybe it has a schedule. Um, and maybe the fact that it has a schedule means that it can actually work a little bit more efficiently than me, <laughs> a lot more efficiently than me. Um, maybe, depending on where these telescopes are based in the world, maybe it knows the weather. Um, in its location. So I don't need to worry about the weather in the location where the telescope is because it, it either has its own weather sensors or, or it's linked into local weather sensors. It also knows what to do when the weather is bad. Clearly it knows what to do when the weather is dark uh, and when the weather is, you know, when the sun is up and then and it, it can sleep as, as the rest of us do. Actually, no, it's the other way around. Okay. So for those that answered the first question, here's another one. Uh, again, this could go one of many ways, but let's see what we get. Can you name any robotic telescopes? You will have heard of a couple, I think, yesterday from from the from Naira's talk. Those of you that watch Naira's talk, it's too late to go back and watch the recording now. Um, but can you name any robotic telescopes? So GTC, Liverpool, Fox, Gregor. Okay. Okay. Super power uh, eyes. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think most of those sound like they they're based on on the Canary Islands. Ghost. So. 
at the Open University, LCO. So I think most of them are okay. here. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. That's my list. Um, the first one, the top one, I suppose, is a bit of a, a trick. But uh, if you think of any of the famous or, or even the less well-known spacecraft, um, they are all in, in some senses robotic or remote telescopes. With the exception of Hubble, we are not going to fix these things on a regular basis. And even with Hubble, it, it works independently. Um, again, doesn't need to worry about the weather, of course. Um, as was mentioned, Tady uh, has Pirate and Coast, the two Open University telescopes, uh, amongst others that are robotic. Uh, and La Palma has the Liverpool telescope, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about later as well. OK, uh, again, from Jacob's comment, we had one answer, which I think was, was valid. Why would we use them? What, what would be the advantages of using a robotic telescope? I think this is the last question for a little while. So this is the last time I'll ask you to, to, to contribute. Let me see if I can drag the chat. Traffic time to avoid travel with clouds. You, yep. don't, uh, you don't need to be out with the telescope. Uh, logistics are easier all the time. Uh, the same way we use robots for uh, various of our work. Uh, it works by itself to use it in space without being exposed to radiation. Uh, use telescope in the best location from your home. Yep. Again, the home. Okay, that sounds like a pretty good list. That that may be a, a, a better list than, than the list I have. That that's what I have. I think we have most of the ones that, that were mentioned there. Um, it is a much smarter way of using what is, in some respects, a limited resource. There, there is not enough telescope time for everybody. Um, but this is a very clever way of, of of ensuring that we use that telescope time well. It also removes what I've put there as human thinking time. But but you can think of the human in the loop as being the stop, um, an object is spotted that is doing something interesting um, and I receive an email and I'm out or I'm making coffee or I'm in the shower or I'm sleeping or I'm in the bar or where, you know, people will judge on which of those is most likely, but um, it removes the that requirement for me to go, yes, this is a good idea, do it. Um, so it takes that initial, this is interesting, and through some clever software can actually point telescopes in the right direction without the human involvement. OK, in robotic senses, without human involvement starts to feel a bit awkward because there are issues when we think about things like um, robotic driving, drive, driverless cars where, where things are not quite right. That, that ties in with the, the next thought as well, this idea of what, what we call targets of opportunity. When you talk this week and think about astronomy, you think about galaxies that exist for hundreds of millions of years at, at, at a minimum, stars that exist for, again, hundreds of millions, billions of years. Um, but there are objects in the night sky that do the opposite, that change in brightness, that appear that weren't there yesterday, that change in brightness over hours, days, weeks. Um, you heard probably mention, have we mentioned it at all? I'm not sure we have, but you, you, I'm sure you've come across the idea of gravitational waves, the, this new sort of regime we have in astronomy of looking in a very different part. I was going to say the electromagnetic spectrum, but, but of course, it's not even the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a very different way of looking, observing the universe. Um, and those objects, if we were to point an optical telescope at them, there might be something to see, but there might be something to see for three or four minutes. So again, by the time I've received the email and thought, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? Should I check with my friend? It's done. So robotic telescopes take all those decision-making stops away. Um, the important thing for you, it also provides telescope time access for, for teachers and for students. It also provides a resource that in, in some places is sold to amateurs. And an example of this are I guess what are called telescope farms. These things exist in Arizona. I think they exist in Australia as well, where somebody builds a building, a small building, and rents space in there. And you provide or you buy a telescope and you place it in that building and they plug it in and plug it into the internet for you effectively. And 
you take advantage of the fact that that telescope is in a place where the sky is different to maybe where it is where, where you live. Um, and sadly, although it's not the only reason, but sadly, it stops astronomers flying off to sunny places. Most of the telescope sites in the world, Naira's obviously mentioned La Palma, Canary Islands. We can think about Hawaii. We can think about um, Chile, South Africa. Most telescopes are in what we think of as nice places to visit um, because they're associated with cloudless skies. Sunny places have no clouds by day. No clouds by night, of course, means good astronomy generally means good astronomy. There's a little bit more to it than that. But so sadly, robotic telescopes stop us doing that. Um, so yeah, that's a, a bit of a, a bit of a downside, but you can twist that round and think about the carbon footprint. So um, there is a positive even there. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about robotic telescopes and prim almost all these telescopes, in fact, yeah, pretty much these telescopes operate in the optical the visible wave band, that very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes uh, work very well at. Um, we'll talk about two meter telescopes, one meter telescopes, 0.4 meter telescopes. What I'm referring to there with that two meters is the area at the bottom of the, or the, the area of the mirror. In fact, two meters is the diameter of the mirror. And the larger the mirror the, on your telescope, the more photons you can collect. Okay, that's a, a very broad statement, but but it's it's broadly true. A two meter telescope will collect more photons than a one meter telescope, or if you like to think of it in a different way, a two meter telescope will collect those photons more quickly. Um, in astronomy, bigger telescopes generally do better science. That's not 100% true because you can put a very, very good camera on a small telescope. You can put a very good spectrograph on a small telescope. Equally, if you put a very average camera on a good telescope, your science is going to suffer. But but broadly speaking, the larger the telescope, the better. So there are three two meter telescopes in the world that do a significant amount of education. Um, they are the two red dots here, which are the two Fulks telescopes dot on the left is in Hawaii, the dot on the right is in Australia, uh, and the yellow telescope, which is, sorry, the yellow dot is the telescope, Liverpool telescope, which is on La Palma and the Canary Islands. So these are three of the, the telescopes that we, we use and we allow teachers and students to use, and we will come on later to how, how you do use those. Um, that's all the technical information that you need. It's probably more technical information than you actually need. So I won't go through that. I don't want to go into the detail particularly, but again, if, if people are interested, we can come back and talk about that. But the, t the telescopes, for example, have uh, a spectrograph on them as well, although it's a fairly low resolution spectrograph. It's not something that's used. It's used primarily for science. So we don't generally offer projects that use spectral data for education we would like to but it's really complicated and with the people i work with we don't necessarily have the full background to to allow you to explore that so we're, we're thinking about it we're working on ideas all the time but spectrograph spectroscopy is not something we offer directly because there is so much more going on but but we appreciate that the fact that there is so much more going on means we really we really do need to address that so here's where it gets a little bit complicated the Fulks telescopes the two two meter telescopes were sold so we started off as the as the owners of the telescopes and the operators of those telescopes and we provided time for a range of science projects and uh, a lot of time for UK and Ireland schools Okay, only UK and Ireland initially. Those telescopes were then sold to a, a bigger group of telescope providers, telescope um, engineers called Las Cumbres Observatory. They're based in uh, Santa Barbara in California, and they have taken the idea of, of putting telescopes in different parts of the world and run with it to the point where they now have a network of telescopes, which you can see here sort of illustrated by the, the dots on the map. What they are achieving by doing this is kind of two or three separate really good benefits. OK, they're spending an awful lot more money on telescopes, um, but they are providing telescope time at different parts in different parts of the world. The first thing to note is that they are doing that in the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, 
I think we're predominantly Northern Hemisphere in, 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 this, in this course. Um, but those of you that are based in the Southern Hemisphere or have been to the Southern Hemisphere know that the sky is very different. The stars and the constellations that you're used to, we don't see them or we don't see them in the same positions. Um, there are objects in the night sky in the Southern Hemisphere that I will never see if I don't leave the UK, unless, of course, I have a robotic telescope. Um, such as the center of our galaxy, such as the Magellanic Clouds. By the time you travel as far south as Tenerife, you're starting to see some of these objects. But again, to see the full splendor, if you like, of those objects, you, you probably need to go to the southern hemisphere. Um, so that's one reason why you would put telescopes in the north and south. By putting them in different locations around the planet, let me see if I can give you an example. South Africa is pretty much the same time zone as us. So right now it's mid, or, uh, well, I was going to say early morning. It's early morning for me. It's mid morning for most of you. Um, Australia is eight or nine hours ahead of us. That means it's about 6 p.m. I'm doing this on, on, on the top of my head. It's about 5 or 6 p.m. It's their winter. So it's probably dark on the west coast of Australia right now. Sorry, you started again. The east coast of Australia right now. Um, in Chile, Chile is four or five hours behind us in time. That makes it 5 a.m. So it's probably dark in Chile right now. It's certainly dark in Hawaii right now. So this sort of comes back to that idea I mentioned of targets of opportunity. Objects that change in brightness. If you only have one telescope, you have to wait until it's dark at that location. And if it's rainy at that location, you have to wait until it stops raining. If you have multiple telescopes in multiple sites, you start to get around that problem. There is always a, se a set of telescopes that is in darkness. There is most likely a set of telescopes that is in a, a, a region that has good weather. Um, Hawaii will have more good observing nights per year than bad observing nights per year. Same as the Canary Islands, the same as, as South Africa, same certainly as Chile as well. So what LCO has done, and, and they're primarily a science organization, is they've started to put this idea of what they call time domain astrophysics. Astrophysics, but astrophysics that is happening now. Astrophysics that, that is happening today, tomorrow. Rather than astrophysics where we can look at a galaxy, your uh, successors, your, your children, your children's children, and so on, can look at that galaxy in hundreds of years' time thousands of years time if you want to go that far and that galaxy will look exactly the same okay maybe you change the way the camera works but the galaxy itself is is unchanging to it to a large extent um, but some of the objects that we're interested in many of the objects we're interested in we do need to get on the sky as, as quickly as we can okay this is an image of Fox telescope north so Fox telescope north is the lower the bottom pair of buildings in the image, the, the white buildings right down the bottom of the image. This is on a dormant volcano in Hawaii called, um, the mountain is called Haleakala on the island of Maui. And this is part of a US, this is where I need to do the men in black thing on you all, because this is part of a US military site. So most of what you see here, don't tell people about because it's US military. As I understand it, it is satellite tracking. And my guess is, they're not tracking their own satellites. So we should probably move on from that before we get into trouble with the US government. Probably not the best government to get into trouble with. Um, let me show you some other images. So these are some images of the two meter and one meter telescopes around the world. And again, you can see that there's a range of different landscapes. Um, if you're working with, with your children on, on things like geography, you can sort of start to explore that, that, that some of these objects uh, some of these telescopes are up at nine, 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters or so. Other objects are reasonably close to sea level. You, you pick the observatories where, where the land masses are. Um, you can almost go into kind of politics and, and economics and think about why certain sites are very good for telescopes, other sites less good. Clearly, it comes down to weather, it comes down to infrastructure. There used to be the case that it came down to kind of what you would refer to, I suppose, as stability of government. You don't want to invest millions of pounds of your telescope in, in a location where if the government changes, things go quite badly wrong. So, so there, there are issues there that you can kind of explore that are way, way away from astronomy, way away from physics. But you can, you can 
you know you can provoke the, the children or, or encourage children to to think about where where you would put telescopes on on the earth's surface and what the benefits are from doing that um an image that naira will be familiar with because this is just up the road i guess from her or up a fairly long winding road um, these are a couple of the 0.4 meter telescopes sitting in a in a building in on mount Haiti. so just um, a few miles or so from La Laguna, where, where the IAC is based. Um, a couple of 0.4 meter telescopes. You can see here that it's weird. It, it, it doesn't look the way we draw a telescope. The way we normally draw the telescope is a kind of a square building with a dome on it and, and, a, and a, a slit in the dome and the telescope pokes out, which drives Gustavo wild. But the telescope basically sits within, within a domed structure. In this case, it's different that this is almost like a guess what we'd refer to as a shed it's a small spare square or rectangular building and the roof kind of folds away it's all robotic it all no it, it does it without human intervention we don't need to press go at 7 p.m we don't need to remember to switch it off at 5 a.m it, it, it just is robotic it just knows what to do which is a uh, fantastic uh, benefit to, to everybody um there's an image here as well of the liverpool telescope you probably saw an image if not this image, very similar image from Naira yesterday, looking at the the uh, the telescope that she has access to um, through her project. One of which is is the, the Liverpool telescope here in La Palma. It's not in Liverpool. Um, the reason is clearly the weather. The, the the weather in Liverpool is not conducive to having uh, a, a five million pound, six million euros, six million dollars worth of telescope sitting in the centre of Liverpool with all the noise, with all the pollution, with all the vibration of traffic, with all of the, the, the light pollution. Um, so we put the telescopes where, where they will do the best science. Um, talking of science, or in fact, I guess, looking initially at images, this is an image taken from one of the Fawkes telescopes. It's a black and white image. We talked a bit about this, and I, I suspect Rosa will talk about this this afternoon um, in terms of image processing. But most images we get from the, the, the cameras are black and white. The way we do the color is we take separate black and white images with different filters in, in the telescope, in the light path, and then we combine those. And sometimes that's done for us. Again, if we can use robotic telescopes, we can usually do something clever with the, with the, the colour imaging side of things. I suspect, I hope that many of you would answer the question quite quickly if I ask, but I won't ask because it's not that kind of quiz. Um, but this is M16. It's known as the Eagle Nebula or the Pillars of Creation. It's a very well-known region of space. It's one of the ones that we think of as a, what we call almost a coffee table image those books that you put out to impress your neighbours and your friends that you're clever and you're smart and you're into lots of things. This is one of those real pretty pictures that you, you, you're familiar with from there. Um, there is science going on in this image. Um, you know, there are questions that you can ask that are more scientific than that's pretty what's going on. So that's sort of the link for, for astronomers is to actually encourage uh, students not just to look at the image and go, oh, that's pretty, but to in include you know, what's going on to ask them, you know, what's going on here. And this is a star forming region. This is a region where we think stars are still being formed. That is our color version. This image is actually probably about 12 or 14 years old. And that is an image in color of the same object. It's not bad. It starts to show you something about the structure. You can feel some of the 3D-ness. You can these images are 2D images by 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 the way we take them, but you can start to feel that third dimension. The dimension of depth is is in that image. Your, your eyes will actually see that. Um, this is quite a nice image. It's not too far removed from the NASA image, which is that one. Um, so that's the Hubble image that is the very familiar image, go back to our one, it's not far off. So the Hubble image cost the cost of Hubble, which was a few, I suspect, billion dollars. Then we visited Hubble on three or four separate occasions. Each occasion we visited, it was another few hundred million dollars. This is an image that you can get for free by either taking the image yourself or by exploring the archives of these telescopes and pulling out other people's data and using other people's data, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Um, so that's the Hubble image. You can see NASA has kind of moved the pillars so they're now vertical 
because presumably the eye is a little bit happier, the eye and the brain are a little bit happier with vertical. They are pillars after all. So you can see that there's, there's a, a decent comparison. We're not playing around with small toys that give you a little smudge or a little faint idea and, and you have to convince your students that that's, that's the real image. Um, this is another one. This is an image. Again, this is uh, one of the beauties of, of imaging from the Southern Hemisphere is looking at objects such as the Tarantula Nebula. So this is in um, one of the Magellanic Clouds. I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but it's in one of the Magellanic Clouds. And again, this is a star forming region. All the stars here, most of the stars here look very blue. Blue stars suggest they are very hot. We are following kind of the black body rule or Vine's law, if you like, the hotter the star, the bluer the light that comes from it. So we see a lot of very blue stars here, which means they are hot and it also means they are young stars. So again, this is a region of star formation. All the structure, all the white lines that you see around here uh, are um, uh, filaments of gas. This is the gas that is going to make up the stars or the gas that didn't quite make the stars that's then kind of been thrown out. So these are, are images of um, star forming regions. Uh, I can move very, very quickly, probably quicker than you can do with your students through life cycle of stars. We did star birth. We've ignored star life. This is star death. This is the other end. This is the one, one of the very few things where all students seemingly throughout the world get to experience astronomy, stars blow up. At the end of their lives, stars blow up. The bigger the star, the bigger the explosion generally. And this is a supernova remnant. This is the, the, the insides of a star after the star has blown up. We know that this star is, uh, sorry, that we know that this supernova, that the explosion that caused this thing we see on the screen, was in 1054 AD, which means it's nearly a thousand years old. We know that because the Chinese astronomers of the day documented this. They, 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 they understood this. They actually saw this star in the daytime sky. It was that bright. So we don't see stars in the daytime sky apart from the sun. So this star, this is the Crab Nebula. It's in, it's in the constellation of Taurus. Um, and some of the structure here that you see these filaments are to do with the way the star has exploded. The colors we see in this image, the reds and the greens, start to tell us a little bit about the chemical composition. Not much, nowhere near as much as if we did proper spectroscopy. But typically when we see red light, we usually start to associate that with hydrogen. When we see green light, we start to associate that with oxygen three. Now, again, there is more to it than that, but it just gives us a, a little feeling of, of what's going on. So this is a, 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 a star death, if you like. Um, we can zoom out. We can go to other parts of the, the universe. This is a galaxy known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. It looks a little bit how we think our Milky Way looks, but of course we're in the middle or towards the middle, if you like, of our, of our galaxy. So we don't see our galaxy in this way, but we think our galaxy looks a bit like this. It's a spiral galaxy. And this is an image of a spiral galaxy called M51, um, just to give you an, an idea of, of how these images look. And again, there's not loads and loads of color in here, although it, we call it a color image. When we combine red light and green light and blue light, we tend to get white light. So we lose some of the color information. It's all in there because when we look at the original images, we can see the red light, green light, and blue light separated out. Um, but we are sort of playing around with the science. We're, we're somewhere in the middle of science and art here, uh, which is something I'll, I'll sort of come back to in a second as well. Um, Alvaro is probably here today, so I have to be careful because the teacher who took this image on the left-hand side is in the room. So, if you think it's good, tell him and not me. The image on the bottom right is a, <coughs> excuse me one second. I'm so amazed by this image. I had almost had a coughing fit. The image on the bottom right is Centaurus A. It's a radio galaxy. This galaxy is visible in the optical, hence we can take images of it in the optical. It's about a thousand times bigger than our galaxy. It has a black hole in the center which we think is about a thousand times bigger than the black hole in the center of our galaxy. This 
galaxy is known to astronomers for lots of different reasons. It's known to astronomers who image black holes or are interested in black holes. Uh, it's known to astronomers who are interested in X-ray property uh, properties of galaxies. It's also known to get to images to astronomers who are interested in radio galaxies. So this particular galaxy has lots of different things going on in it. It's very, very bright in the radio, it's bright in the X-ray. That starts to tell us about some of the processes that are going on there. It's not just heat. To get X-rays, you have to heat things up very, very greatly. However, you can also produce X-rays in astronomy through lots of different processes other than kind of black body type processes. We, again, don't really have time to go into that today, unfortunately, but um, if you take my word for that, hopefully then that will, will be okay. The image on the top left is an image taken by one of our users, somebody who's been working with the project for many years now, um, and it's of Centaurus A, and it's of a supernova that occurred in Centaurus A. So not content with being this galaxy that, that all astronomers love and know anyway, it had a supernova a few years ago, and Alvaro was fortunate enough to take some, some tele or, or smart enough to take some teles telescope images of this object and to produce a, a nice uh, image on the, the left hand side there, which I'm sure if you ask him more about, he'd be happy to, to share the information. I think I've already touched on this point. I, I, I think we're probably in a group where this statement is kind of obvious, but let, let's put it in here anyway. Um, astronomy generally fascinates people. It interests people. They, they, they want to know more about what you do, what you study, how you study it. Um, sometimes, depending on the curriculum you're, you're, you're working with, depending on the age groups you're working with, you don't find lots of opportunities to put astronomy in, in its true sense into your lessons. You might talk about the life cycle of stars. We might talk about the solar system. We might be able to mention exoplanets, the Big Bang, um, expansion of the universe. Sometimes that's as much as that's as far as we can go. However, astronomy is a very, very good vehicle to introduce maths, to introduce IT, coding, you know, Excel, anything like that. We talked about spectroscopy. Chemistry is 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 really you know, chemistry and spectroscopy are, are, are one and the same thing in, in many respects. When we talk about exoplanets, other planets around other stars, we immediately start to think about biology or astrobiology. Are these planets the types of planets that could harbor life? What would life on other planets look like? Some of that is that kind of profound staying awake at night, thinking about it type questions. Other parts of that are legitimate science questions. What are the markers? What elements, what spectra could we take of objects to see whether there are traces of life? How far away from Earth would you need to be before you realize there was life on Earth? And, and what wave bands would you look at? Or what wave, wave bands would you look in? One thing also we, we try to do, and I think all of these projects do it, and, and Naira will, will talk more about this in her talk as well, is the idea of getting schools to collaborate. Um, getting scientists to work together, not just to lock them in individual rooms and write papers, but to lock them in individual rooms and get them to communicate via email or to get them to communicate via Zoom or Skype and collaborate. And if you can do that internationally, you know, that makes the world a better place for, for, for many reasons, as I'm, I'm sure you realize. Oh, sorry, Mr. Slide. Sometimes science takes a back seat. Sometimes you, you do everything you can to introduce all the amazing science behind these objects and you give the images to students and you allow them access to something like Photoshop and they ignore all the science and they create these rather strange or rather weird uh, art type images. So there is no real science in these images anymore. They, that's kind of been processed out. But this is sort of a a way of introducing that A into STEAM. So we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths. These are the key skills. These are what we want every kid to, to learn. However, some students have artistic leanings. They want to do art. They want to, to sort of play around with things that look pretty, look nice in, in, in however, you, however you couch those terms. Um, and this is a way of sort of doing that. You, you can just play around. You don't damage the original images because they're, they're in, a, in a format where you don't damage them. However, you can create these, these rather strange patterns if, if, if the kids so desire. 
Okay, again, those of you that did this last year, you have to keep quiet at this point, but promise me you'll keep quiet. Can you spot an asteroid in this image? I'll tell you the answer straight away. No, you can't. Uh, there is nothing in this image to tell you anything really about any of those objects. Um, they look like a bunch of stars to me. Some seem to be brighter than others, the ones that look bigger on the screen. Are they brighter because they're really brighter or are they just nearer? We don't know. So a single image doesn't always tell us very much. However, as astronomers, we tend to work black on white. It tends to be easier on the eye. If you're looking at lots of these images, um, it really does start to, to become tricky to do it, to do things um, the other way around. Do you see it now? No, not really. How about now? Hopefully, this is where chat should light up. The people should go, yes, we see it. They're not. Do people see a, an object moving? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I can't. No, I apologize. I can't see the chat. There we go. I can't persuade the chat. Yeah, yeah. Myself. Yes. Okay, a lot of yes. <laughs> good, 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 good. Okay, then, then I'm doing something right. People have stayed awake this long. Um, yes, there is an asteroid in this image. There is one object that is moving with respect to the background. So all the other stars are staying still. And over the course, let's say, of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we take three separate images and one object moves with respect to the background. We'll come on to what an asteroid is in a minute. We'll get you to do a little bit of work to, to try and get your heads around that. But basically, it's a lump of rock that was left over from the formation of the solar system. So most of the solar system went into forming the sun and then the planets, particularly the larger planets. But there is this pile of rubble, this pile of leftover stuff. Um, and amongst that leftover stuff is are the asteroids. What you will hopefully see is the asteroid there that is moving with respect to the background. If you haven't seen the talk before, or if you've forgotten, there is a second one just down there. It might not come across that easily on your screens, but there is a second asteroid. That's a lesson of science in itself. Um, the lesson being, don't just look for the obvious, but sometimes things appear in your object in your images that you weren't expecting and that that's that's a uh, a lesson i think for, for scientists in, in in many different regimes but yeah there is there are different images within here that you can see um i'll show you an example of that as well going back a few years now some schools from different parts of the U of, of the europe um imaged an asteroid called kariba they met up via skype and again eight nine years ago schools weren't really meeting up over skype that much um, we had a, a grant to, to do this, and they used a, a package, which again, Rosa will probably talk to you about this afternoon, called Salsa J, and they produce what's called a light curve. The light curve is actually, let's start with top left. Top left is the same sort of thing multiple images of an asteroid traveling from kind of top right to bottom left. Um, the more perceptive amongst you, those with better internet connections as well, perhaps, may see that there are actually two objects. And again, it's the same principle as the previous image. Sometimes you look and you find more than you were expecting to find. The image on the bottom right is what we call a light curve. It's the change in brightness of the asteroid over time. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is brightness, and we see what astronomers would describe as a perfect sine wave. Mathematicians will look at me like I'm crazy and say that is not a sine wave, but to an astronomer, that is perfect sine wave. Okay, I know that it's not quite, but it's not far off. When you see a sine wave in astronomy, it starts to tell you something about rotation or something about orbit. Something is changing with brightness and every however many hours, days, weeks, returns to that zero point, returns to that start start of the curve point. So again, that's an interesting discovery and it's a collaborative effort. Let me just check to see whether this, okay, I apologize. Um, just to finish that point off, that is six schools worth of data. Each school has some data, but each school only has enough data to draw one sixth of the graph. So it's only the collaborative nature that allows you to see everything that's going on. So it is that life lesson. Again, if you collaborate, if you share data with others, 
the pool of data becomes more meaningful to everyone. Um, just going to finish off this this part of the, the presentation by showing you this as well. Um, I appreciate we're flying through lots of different things and I'm saying, you know, you can take images, you can do science. Yes, you can, but we, we understand that not everybody has the time, has the students, has the, the background knowledge to do all of those things. So don't be overwhelmed if we show you all these amazing advanced projects. We don't expect you to do that in, in week one, week two. We provide resources and encouragement all the way through. And we like to show you these stories of people doing really good things because we think it inspires. But we also know that some schools and some teachers will be happy to just download some images or to point the telescope at, at M16, to point the telescope at M51 and take their own images. And that's absolutely fine. We're, we're more than happy with this. This is an example of a, a student that worked with us a few years ago. Um, we do a lot of work in Germany with different groups and he discovered his own asteroid. Doesn't get to name it. Sorry, but pardon, no, he probably does get to name it, but he doesn't, he isn't able to name it after himself and he can't name it after McDonald's or Coca-Cola or Bayern Munich. It has to be something that is sort of, has some sort of scientific um, good to it. <clears throat> I'm going to jump away. I appreciate I've got about half an hour or so left. So I'm going to jump away from the astronomy a little bit now. I'm going to talk you through a couple of slides and then we'll get you to do an activity for a few minutes just to, just to break things up. We have a project in, in Cardiff as well called Down to Earth, and this is a STEM project. And it's looking at things like asteroids, comets, meteorites, uh, the death of the dinosaurs, and so on. Now, if your students are not interested in the asteroid or the comet that hit Earth and killed all the dinosaurs, they are not a normal group of students because most kids love the fact that, that there were dinosaurs, love the fact that the dinosaurs were killed by an asteroid and so on. So you, you're on good ground there. You're on ground where the students will, will, will run with it. Um, there are or there is a series of different resources that I will show you uh, based around this topic, this area. But you can think straight away of applications in astronomy, in geography, the makeup of our planet, in geology, the rocks on our planet. Um, and if you impact something onto the Earth's surface, that comes with physics, um, that comes with maths and IT. And we hope it's suitable for lots of different age groups as well. It's relevant. Um, we remember a few years ago, this event in Russia, where uh, there was a meteor that came across in, in the daytime didn't really cause much damage, didn't really cause many injuries. However, the politicians said, well, what if instead of this being in Chelyabinsk, this was over Berlin or over Paris or over London? And if it had been, could we have predicted it? And if we could predict it, what would we do? So there are all sorts of things, all sorts of sort of questions that for sort of the, the implications of this that, that, that you can kind of explore with your students as well. Um, like I say, there are lots of IPSI extended project type resources that we, we hope you can work with on that. Um, there are some web links here. Again, this is being recorded, so you can always go back. The presentation as well, I'll upload to Grasp, so you'll be able to get a hold of all these slides. But there are lots of different applications, lots of different ways of, of, of playing around with these data. Um, I'm going to break away from this now. So I'm going to share my internet browser. And I'm going to share this screen first of all. So hopefully you can see that OK. If, if you can't, then I'm sure somebody will shout. But I think I'm sharing the whole screen, so you should be OK. We've created a 46-page booklet. It's only available online right now. It's only available, sadly, in English. Um, however, it talks about the different aspects of objects, such as comets, such as asteroids, such as meteorites, explains what each one is. Now. This is the background science, if you like. The other thing that I want to show you, and it's hidden behind my Zoom window at the moment, so I need to just move around a little bit. There we go. This is the fun part. It's the maths part as well, but this is the part that the kids will love. Um, and I'm going to do this in English. However, if you can see on the right there, it's in several different languages. So it's in Spanish, it's in German, Polish, Romanian, Finnish and so on. So you can do that in any of those languages. Probably best that I do it in English. I'm going to start. And I'm going to design my own asteroid. Um, because of my nature, I want to make the asteroid quite big. So I'm changing the size of the asteroid. 
Um, I'm going to let it hit the earth at 90 degrees because I think that will cause a bit of a, a mess. I'm going to let it hit the earth at quite a fast speed. I'm going to make it out of iron because I know iron is a nice heavy metal. So let's let's make it iron and I'm going to collide it with sedimentary rock on the Earth's surface. I'm going to stand quite a long way away because I think this might make a bit of a mess. So I'm going to stand at 300 kilometers away. And if I click on submit, OK, the Google Maps part didn't quite work. However, on the left hand side, you can see some numbers. It tells me the size of the crater I've just created with my asteroid. Uh, it tells you the width of the crater. It tells you that it's an 11th magnitude earthquake. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it. For some reason, last, last few years, we seem to ch choose Washington a lot. I don't want to pick somewhere that somebody's based. So, but it, we're not doing it for real. So, okay, let's let's do it in Australia. Apologize to any Australians that are listening, watching. Um, and that's a map of Australia. Let's let, let's land it there. So that has happened in the middle of Australia. That, that's a representation of the size of crater we would create. Now, again, I apologize for many of you, Australia might not be somewhere you know that well. So let's do Paris instead. And again, apologies to any of our French colleagues, but if we do it on Paris, start again, there we go. That is about, that's quite a large part of France that we've, damaged and destroyed by doing that. So we apologize for doing that. Um, doesn't happen for real, I promise. We can actually put a object such as the Eiffel Tower. That's the Eiffel Tower in relation to the size of the crater that we've just created. Okay, so you can kind of see, I don't want to use the word fun too much because we are talking about landing large rocks over large cities, which which is probably a slightly twisted version of, of the word fun. Um, but we get loads of data and the data is kind of driven by the, the science of the project. So we can talk here about the size of the object we created, the speed it was traveling at. And we are using the equation energy is half mv squared. OK, the faster the object is, the more massive the object is, the larger the amount of energy involved, the larger the amount of energy involved, you know, the, the, the more damage you do. There is all sorts of fairly graphic information about what happens to you if you're standing 300 kilometers away, such as the fact that trees ignite, such as the fact that wooden frame buildings will collapse, small bridges will collapse. So yeah, it, it, it gets not graphic in, 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 in too many senses, but it, it is a fairly descriptive way of saying what will happen. The key, if your children are particularly young, is to mention that this will happen every 1.9 billion years. So it's not likely to happen tomorrow. It's not likely to happen next week or next year. OK, but we know with these events, they, they will happen. So you can play around with this. And, and, and the booklet explains how to do that. You, you can play around with creating the largest crater, the smallest crater. Um, you can play around with reproducing craters on the Earth's surface. So we know of craters via things like Google Maps, and we can kind of reverse engineer what size of rock would we need to create that crater. You can do it, of course, with the, the extinction event that we think um, caused the death of the dinosaurs. Now, I'm just looking at time, and I think what I'm going to do, even though I've demonstrated this now, I'm not going to ask you to play around with it right now. It, it's a nice workshop in its, in its own right, but I, I'm just conscious of time that I will run out of time to tell you all the other things I want to tell you. Um, is there any questions about the, the impact calculator? Any thoughts on that just while I have, have it on my screen? Um, so I'm just checking if somebody wants to jump in with anything at that point. Uh, I will say as well, you can reverse, you know, you can create any, um, size asteroid you like, I guess, from, from the parameters here. But you can put those on the moon and you can put those on Mars as well. So you can actually play around with the different um, planets and see what that would do. In the absence of any pressing questions, like I say, what, what I will do is I'm going to go back to my slides because um, I apologize, but I don't think I'm going to get through all my slides as it is, um, although we will share them all with you. But here's, here's an example of some things you can do. You can go onto Wikipedia, find the largest crater in your country, 
and try and reproduce it and think about the asteroids, think about the, the, the physics involved. You can change the size of the asteroid and see what that does to the size of the crater. And you can plot the two against each other using Excel. So you can invoke a little bit of science, a little bit of maths and IT in there as well. So hopefully that's of use. Like I say, it's in many, many different languages as well. Um, I'm going to move on and just talk a little bit more about some of the, the more advanced stuff. This was one that was discussed yesterday. We talked about the, Gal the Galilean moons, the moons of the system uh, of Jupiter, and the fact that they eclipse or they transit the Jup Jupiter. And that, that's how we know about, that's how we started to think about the solar system in the way we understand it. That happens with the moons of Uranus as well. And this is a, a light curve again. So this is the same sort of plot that I showed you before with time going across and brightness on the y-axis, the, the, the vertical axis. And this is the, uh, the, the crossing of one moon of Uranus in front of another moon. The fact that one moon passes in front of the other means there is a dip in light. And that dip in light is what we're measuring on this graph. It's kind of noisy. Um, you often see data represented by, you know, like I say, straight lines, beautiful sine waves. Real data doesn't generally do that. This is more what real data does. And that's, again, I think an, an interesting, useful lesson for your students. Um, you know, not everything works in, in, in the perfect, you know, you know, follows the equation to, to the exact letter. Data does weird things now and again. And, and sometimes half the fun is actually trying to resolve why. Um, I sort of almost touched on it and then I, I, I held back and I thought I'll show you this slide as well. This is the same sort of thing again. It's a light curve. Again, time on the x-axis, brightness on the, on the y-axis. This is the transit. This is the passing of a planet across its own star, across the face of its star. We know of this, we know Venus does this in our solar system, we know Mercury does this, we know of the, the Venus and Mercury transits, but we've started to see this happening with exoplanet systems. Now in 1992, the very first exoplanet system was discovered. We thought they existed before that. We didn't think that ours was the only solar system, ours were the only planets. But until 1990, 1992, we had no evidence of that. From 1992 to 1995, we started to develop a little bit more evidence. That's when the, the study of exoplanets really took off. Since then, we've had lots of satellites, things like the Kepler mission, that have gone on to discover hundreds, if not thousands, more uh, stars with planets around them. This work was done nearly 10 years ago by two students I was working with at the time. We looked at one of the exoplanet databases. We discovered a suitable target. We pointed our telescopes at it, we took the data, we analyzed the data, and we created an Excel graph. And you see here this dip. And the dip is, is basically the brightness of the star fading by a small fraction because the planet is blocking it out, is passing across the front of it. And again, exactly the same thing I mentioned before, the data does not look perfect. It's not a perfectly u-shaped graph with perfect sides to it because real data isn't like that i'm afraid that's that would make life a lot easier but real data doesn't behave in that way so this was work done by a couple of students of ours a few years ago um, on occasion we've been lucky enough to produce scientific papers where students teachers have contributed and when we do that as with all scientists we are very happy to share that spotlight to share that um, uh, contribution that they've made and, and to acknowledge that contribution. So on, on occasions, we've had students and teachers who've been included in papers for the work they've done, which we're, we're more than happy to do. This is a project that if you come to this uh, event again next year, I may be able to tell you a little bit more about because it's starting to look like it's the top of my list of things to do. Um, working with Rosa, we are very keen to produce a project looking at black holes. Again, if, if students of yours are not interested in black holes, there's something strange going on. But we, um, and I know Rose has been very successful in doing this in, in different forms with schools already, um, but we love the idea of producing light curves from black holes. Now, I, I know that kind of feels a bit weird and a bit unlikely because black holes don't emit light and so on. Again, subject of an hour talk someday, but um, 
trust me on this, you can measure the brightness of objects around black holes and that tells you something about what's going on there. And so there's a little bit, a lot more to it, but hopefully we'll we'll come back and explain that to you at some point in, in the future. Um, from that black holes in my schoolwork, we were very lucky a couple of years ago to work with a, a teacher and student in Switzerland. Uh, Philip Corwell was the teacher, Dana Perez was the, the student. They um, went off and did their own thing. Very often they would ask me questions and I didn't reply quickly enough. And they found another object that was nearby that looked a bit like the object that we'd already been playing around with. They went off and took some data. Uh, just so happened that that object was changing in brightness in a way that scientists were very interested. And the scientists ended up writing a paper and both Philip and his student, and in fact, Rosa and myself were all included on the final paper um, in recognition of our, our contribution to that, which was a really, really nice story. Um, I'm going to talk in the remaining few minutes a little <laughs> a little about some of the other things I'm going to do I'm going to run out of time very spectacularly as I always do um, the Gaia mission is a European Space Agency mission it um, looks at our Milky Way looks at the way our Milky Way behaves looks at the distribution of stars in our Milky Way it does more than that as a kind of a secondary science mission it takes lots of images of the night sky and it spots when things have changed from the last time it looked at that particular part of the sky it revisits part of the sky it finds things that have changed in brightness and it it, it lets us know um, and it produces these things called alerts um, so ESA's mission for Gaia is, is a billion stars with a billion pixels for a billion euros um, so it's not a cheap mission it has the biggest camera ever sent into space and there are loads and loads of really nice um, drawings and, and cartoons and, and background science on the two web links that I, I mentioned here. Um, and we have produced, in addition to that, lots of different background sheets on some of the other things that Gaia does. So how its camera works, how it communicates with the Earth, how it was launched, what its precision is, and, and some of the statistics and, and numbers here are, are mind blowing, even for, for those of us that work in astronomy. On, on a regular or on a daily basis. Um, here's an example of a, of a PDF that we've created, which explains a little bit about how Gaia works. Um, and so, you know, again, we understand that not every student is going to be blown away by light curves. Some of them, for some reason, will not, will not want to do that, will not be particularly bothered. But we can hopefully grab them with, with things like, you know, the, the background science, the, the way that Gaia works, because it's a spacecraft. It was launched on a rocket. So there's some cool stuff going on in whatever way you look at it. Um, in Gaia, again, we were able to work with a teacher and student, as you see their, their names here on this screen. Um, they helped us discover the very first symbiotic star, a particular flavor of, of binary system uh, a couple of years ago. And again, we, we get them on the paper because we know that they, they've been part of the, the team that's helped us gather data. Um, Gaia is probably going to run about another three years. It's probably going to carry on monitoring, looking at the Milky Way till then, finishing this, this survey of the stars in our sky, in our galaxy, and spotting all these new and strange objects such as supernovae along the way. Before it finishes, there will be a, a, a new ground-based telescope called the um, Rubin Observatory, Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile, um, that is going to be about eight and a half meters across, is going to be spotting objects on a daily basis. We think it's going to find about a thousand new objects per day, okay? So I'll come into work and there will be a list of a thousand new objects it's discovered. I have all of you as teachers with me. I have my own telescope time. I have my own telescopes. I take images of 10 of those objects. That, that probably is, is ambitious. Great, fantastic, that's, that's well done to me. However, I come in tomorrow and I have a new email with another thousand objects. And I come in on Friday and I have a thousand objects. And you know what, even though I don't really work Saturdays and Sundays, I get another 2000 objects over the weekend. So we're going to have a problem with what we call big data. We're going to have a problem with understanding what objects are worth following up on. Because if I don't follow up on that object quickly, it doesn't really matter because I get another thousand tomorrow and I get another 7,000 a week. So there's going to be a crazy amount of data, crazy amount of objects of all sorts of flavors. 
all sorts of different types of supernova, all sorts of objects that change in brightness for other reasons. And so just be aware of that. You, you may come across this idea of the Vera Rubin Observatory um, and, and this, this sort of tapping in what we, we think to, to big data. It's, it's a buzzword within, within astronomy. And, and, and again, with, with things like COVID, the way that the pandemic has evolved, the ability to understand, to track large amounts of data and spot trends in them is, is really crucial. And, and developing machines that can do 99% of that work for us is crucial because none of us can do that kind of work in, in, in our own and um, by ourselves. Um, I've got a couple of slides here. Again, I think Naira will, will discuss this in more detail, but um, just to show you little sort of screenshots from, um, from the Fulks telescope and the way that we observe, um, there's not loads of things that you're required to do. You are not filling in page after page after page of information. It's typically 10 separate boxes in terms of the object you want to observe, in terms of the object, uh, the, the exposure time, the filter, and so on. So there are different ways of doing that. I say I'm, I'm kind of conscious of time, so I have to fly through a little bit of, of, of what's left. Um, but Naira hopefully will cover some, some more of this and, and you'll have my email addresses anyway. If you're based in the UK and Ireland, you can register via the top blue link. If you're based in Spain, you can register via the lower blue link. Anywhere else, email me. We can put you in touch either with Naira and one of her groups around the different um, Spanish speaking countries, or uh, we have other groups that we work with in, in the US who are developing worldwide projects to get schools to work collaboratively. So there are always ways and means of, of getting you to do that. Um, I will mention this one, which is the Open University Coast and Pirate, because they have a couple of rob robotic telescopes in Tady. Um, they are generally reserved for their undergrad students. So students that are doing degrees in astronomy um, will get time on these telescopes. However, they also do a free eight week taster course. The idea is you love the the taster course so much that you pay good money to start studying with the Open University. So you can kind of see why you, why they would do that. However, if you follow that really long web link at the bottom of the page, you can do that eight week course and then, you know, then, then just move, move about. And you do get to play around with, with telescopes uh, with them as well. Um, and I was going to say finally, but, but I'll just mention this as well, because this is sort of where, where I do most of my work uh, right now, which is the National Schools Observatory. This is based in Liverpool, working with the Liverpool Telescope and La Palma and, and Naira's group, who obviously provide the, the location for that telescope as well. Um, and they, we have produced lots of different guides for teachers on telescopes. Um, but it's not just about you must use the telescope, you must point at objects, you must download data, you must do science. The NSO has a much wider remit than that um, to support you in anything you do that is to do with astronomy. So the broader field of what astronomy is. Um, for examples, there are here some list of um, different activities you can do, very few of which actually require you to, to do the telescope, but kind of let you to play around with images, workshops. There are the age groups listed here and the time that it takes to do these activities. So both the Fox Telescope Project and, and the National School Observatory are very aware that not everybody comes in as an expert in robotic uh, astronomy, which I think is probably a fair comment. As part of that, I've created a, a series of fairly I suppose, fairly advanced projects. Now, dangerous ground here, but these are designed to be teacher free. These are designed that you point your students at them and your students will go away and leave you alone. We, we think that's a good thing for teachers. We think teachers like that idea. In this case, this is about 40 separate web pages which is everything you needed to know about the life cycle of stars. So how you would understand the life cycle of stars, how you would understand the different types of stars there are, how you understand this diagram that's very famous within astronomy called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which tells you how stars evolve and how stars behave based on their mass and their, their, their birth, um, their, their, their style of birth, if you like. Um, we teach the students how to do photometry. We teach them how to do all the nasty maths. We provide them with 28 data sets of objects that they can play around with but we then encourage them to go and take their own data because we think that's a really important part. Don't just play around with data that we know will work, but go out, find your own data, 
gives you that feeling of ownership, which I think is is really important in in doing science. Um, last year we created another one of these. So so these are there are three separate IBSI type projects I've created, one on open clusters, one on exoplanets, and this one which was on supernovae. This takes students through what supernovae are. It takes them and explains particular flavors of supernova. Different supernovae occur for different reasons. Um, it allows them to play around with photometry, measuring the brightness of objects. In this case, using a browser-based photometry tool. So it's, so it's a free tool that they have access to. We provide them with Excel sheets that give them a template. So we don't just say, oh, just chuck the data in Excel and, and see how you get on. But we give them a, an Excel, shed, Excel spreadsheet that is kind of pre-populated, has some values in there. They can play around with these different supernovae. Um, it allows them to measure the distances to the galaxies where the supernovae are located. And that allows them to take it further and produce what's called the Hubble plot which won the Nobel Prize, or Hubble obviously didn't win the Nobel Prize recently, but um, from Hubble's work in the 20s and 30s, um, there were extension activities done using this kind of method in the late 90s that have recently won the Nobel Prize. Um, and basically, you're playing around with photometry, with supernova, exploding stars, galaxies, and you get to plot the age of the universe, which is not a bad thing to do. Now, I should say, this is not an hour long activity. <clears throat> if students follow each of the web links, if students do this in you know, a, a nice sensible fashion, it might take them six or eight or 10 hours to do the full activity. So these are what we call project type activities, not something to do in, a, in an hour long lesson. However, again, there is an opportunity to be collaborative about this. You know, You don't have to give a full data set to one student. You can share the data out amongst five students and then each of them produces some data towards the final results. So you can play around with this as you choose. Um, there are some links here to Gaia. I'm conscious I'm running out of time, which is why I'm flying through some slides. Um, and I will finish off just by mentioning the idea in a sense of what we're trying to do here is, is playing around with these these objects, playing around with these data, allow students to not just understand about the age of the universe, not just understand about these different flavors of supernova, but it allows them what we think is an insight into the scientific process. You know, what am I going to study? Set a hypothesis, collect some data, analyze the data, report the data, collaborate. All of these are parts of, of what scientists do, you know, on a, on a daily basis. We might be able to put some numbers or some maths in there. So they might measure the periodos periodicity of a system, how, how rapidly it changes. They might be able to put trend lines. They'd be playing around with logarithms, with error bars. And they don't always come up with the answer is 12. Well, you know what? I looked it up in a book and the book says the answer is 12. So I'm great. You know, these answers are not necessarily that clear cut. Um, and we hope with many of these activities that it, it, it serves in a sense, as a springboard, um, that they look at these activities. Okay, right. This is all, this is great. However, I reckon I can do this. I reckon if I did a bit of Python coding, I can make this process quicker. So you know, your students will take this in directions that neither you nor I can predict, which I think is 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 really part of the fun here. There are lots of problems. Um, I'm afraid <laughs> it's astronomy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, we want to give you all the information you need, but we don't want to give you too much information. We understand that you have to install software across Linux, across Macs, across tablets, across Windows. Um, the answer is not always clear cut. Real data does not behave the way that we think data does. It's not straight lines. Um, you know, and again, we, we had some information from a, 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 a images in 2018 that was published in late 2020. So there's a two year time, time scale turnaround sometimes between taking data of an object and publishing it. For a student, that's too long. You know, that, that, that doesn't give that inspirational value in, in the way that, that, you know, students, that we want students to, to take it. So, so there are problems and we, we, you know, we acknowledge those and we, we hopefully um, make some progress towards those. Um, that is my exoplanet one, which I don't have time to discuss today at all, but there's an exoplanet activity as well with the web link at the top if you're interested. 
that is me done bang on 10 30 and only skipped a few slides thank you very much for listening um and i hope some if not all of it was of use and, and again thank you for contributing